And I guess everybody here is a dignitary, and I appreciate your, your help. And by the way, I am serious about the food. Bring in, don't, don't make this slow down. No, no, just come in, clear the place, places. And, and uh, uh, but Hillary has to eat her beets. small enough and the room is uh, intimate enough, I'd like to uh, uh, spend our time uh, responding to questions you have, uh, listening to advice you might have. Uh, occasionally, as, uh, as I did just a moment ago, I get envelopes like that, which is, and I'll open this and there'll be campaign ideas. Why don't you talk about the following issue? So I'm happy to take advice and then we can all vote on whether it's a good piece of advice or bad advice. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so we'll We'll, uh, we'll get a chance to do that, but I, I'm, I'm looking to get your your perspectives. I uh, just tell you a couple of things you may not know about me. Um, uh, you probably know that I'm father of five and, and grandfather now of 18. My uh, oldest son just had, had two uh, had twins uh, just last week, and uh, so our, our grandchild nest is getting larger, and they're a source of great joy. When I was uh, uh, when I was Probably halfway through my career at Bain Consulting, I met with a lawyer to draft a will. And uh, and she said, how do you want to divide what estate you might eventually have? And I said, I'd love to. I didn't have anything at that point. I said, I want to divide it equally among my five sons. And she said, well, how much will you want to give to the grandchildren that they will ultimately have? And I said, well, I don't want to give anything to, that, to the grandchildren. No, I'll give it to the sons, and they in turn will give it to their, their children as needed. And she said, you'll change your mind. I said, no, no, I don't think so. So I saw her not long ago, and I said, I don't want to give anything to my son. So I said, you've lost Samantha's boat. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this, uh, it's not just this is my daughter. It's, uh, it, it's not just because I, uh, uh, I love my grandchildren, as I do. I love my sons and daughters. I'm very concerned about what the nation is going to be like over the coming uh, decade or two. And, uh, and, I, and I really do, as I said in my remarks earlier, I see these two very different scenarios. One is a, as a, America really powering the world economy with an extraordinary economy here, with China working with us, wanting to see stability in the world, um, and uh, a, a very vibrant America with freedom and, 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 and prosperity for uh, the great bulk of the American people. On the other, side, on the other hand, I really do see something like Europe, and and I think that's the path we're on right now. So that that that's why I, I want to make sure that what I what little I'll have left after the campaigns goes to that, goes to, goes to my uh, my grandchildren. Um, that's one piece of, uh, about me that you may not know. The other is just about my my heritage. My dad, you probably know, was uh, was the governor of Michigan and was the head of a car company, but he was born in Mexico, and. Uh, had he been born of, of Mexican parents, I'd have a better shot of winning this, but he was not. Unfortunately, <laughs> <laughs> one of Americans living in Mexico, they lived there for a number of years, and uh, uh, I mean, I say that jokingly, but it would be helpful to be uh, Latino. And, uh, uh, pardon? Elizabeth Warren. That's right, that's right, I can go on and say. For those that don't know Elizabeth Warren, she is the woman who's running for U.S. Senate in Massachusetts, who, who, who said that she's Cherokee, and has put in her application over the years that she's Cherokee, and Harvard put down that she's one of their minority uh, faculty members. It turns out that at most she's 132nd Cherokee, and even that can't be proven. So uh, in any event, uh, yeah, I can put down, my dad was born in Mexico, and leave it at that. But, uh, but his, his dad was in construction, very successful in Mexico, but in America, it went broke more than once. So my dad never had the money or time to get a college degree. Uh, without a college degree, he became head of a big car company and ultimately a governor. And, and believed in America, uh, believed in the opportunity in this country, uh, never doubted for a moment that he could achieve his dreams. And Ann's dad, my wife's dad, was born in Wales. Uh, his dad was a coal miner. This coal miner got injured in the coal mining accident, uh, realizing that there was no future there for him or his four children, he came to Detroit and uh, worked in the auto factories until he could save enough money to bring his kids over, which he did. And, uh, and then they got together as a family and said, you know, to be successful in America, you've got to get an education. And they couldn't afford an education. 
and the kids and the parents said, you know, if we all work and we all save, we could afford to send one of us to college. And they, they sent my wife's dad. Can you imagine working every day, taking a couple of jobs and saving your money so that your brother could go to, I mean, I would never do that for my brother. <laughs> that he go to, so he went to college and got a degree at the General Motors Institute of Technology, which, which is one of these programs where you work a semester and then you go to school a semester. And, and, uh, and then after it was over, he started a little company and he became more successful and he was able to hire his brothers and his brother-in-law. And, uh, and provide for them in an extraordinary way. By the way, both, both my dad and Ann's dad did quite well in their lives, uh, but when they came to the end of their lives and, and passed along the inheritances to Ann and to me, we both decided to give it all away. So I have inherited nothing. Everything that Ann and I have, we, uh, we earned the uh, old-fashioned way. And that's by hard work. And, uh,
Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's interesting. There's a, the former head of uh, Goldman Sachs, John Whitehead, uh, was also the former head of the New York Fed Reserve. And, uh, and I met with him, and he said, as soon as the Fed stops buying all the debt that we're issuing, which they've been doing, the Fed's buying like three quarters of the debt that America issues. He says, what's that, what's that over? That's over. He said, we're going to have a failed treasury auction. Interest rates are going to have to go up. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're living in this borrowed fantasy world where, where the government keeps on borrowing money. You know, we, we borrow this extra trillion a year. We wonder, well, who's, who's loaning us a trillion? The yeah. Chinese aren't loaning us anymore. The Russians aren't loaning it to us anymore. So who's giving us a trillion? And the answer is, we're just making it up. The Federal Reserve is, is just taking it and saying, here, we're giving it. It's just made up money. And, uh, and this, this does not augur well. Uh, for uh, for our economic future, yeah, not, not, you know, some of these things are are complex enough. It's not easy for people to understand. But your, your point of saying bankruptcy usually concentrates the mind. Yeah, George. <coughs> Go to your your point on complexity. Yeah. How as you travel around America and talk to people in larger groups, and perhaps people with different backgrounds than people in this room, to what extent do people really understand that we're hurtling toward a cliff? And to what extent do people really understand the severity of the, of the, of the fiscal situation we're in? Do people get it? They, they don't. I mean, by and large, people, people don't get it. Uh, people in our party, in part it's our fault because we've been talking about deficits and debt for about 25 or 30 years as a party, and so they've heard us say it and say it and say it. Uh, the, the fact that Greece is going through what it's going through and they read about France and Italy and Spain has, has finally made this issue topical the American people. And so when you do polls and you ask people what is the biggest issue in the 2012 election, number one is the economy and jobs by a wide margin, but number two is the deficit. And, uh, but, but debt and the, that, doesn't, that doesn't calculate for both, but the deficit does. They're, they're, they recognize you can't go on forever like this. Although the people who recognize that tend to be Republican. And the people who don't recognize it tend to be Democrat. And what we have to get is that five or 10 percent in the middle. Who, who sometimes vote Republican, sometimes vote Democrat, and, and have them understand how important this is. I, I, it's, I mean, it's a challenge. I, mean, I, I did the calculation uh, for folks today, and USA Today publishes this every year. It's a front page story, the, the headline once a year, but somehow escapes people's attention. And that is, if you take the, the total national debt and the unfunded liabilities of Medicare, Social Security, and Medicaid, the amount of debt plus unfunded liabilities per household in America is $520,000 per household. It's like 12 times their income, right? At least. 10 times yeah, yeah, 10, 12 times their income. And, uh, uh, and, and even though we're not going to be writing a check for that amount per household, they're going to be paying the interest on that. You will be paying the interest on that. <laughs> <laughs> because we will, my generation will be long gone, and you'll be paying the interest. And so you'll be paying taxes not only for the things you want in your generation, but for all the things we spend money on, which is just, I mean, it's, it's extraordinary to think that tax rates, someone calculated what would happen if we don't change Medicare or Social Security. The tax rate, you know what the payroll tax is now, it's 15.3%. If we don't change those programs, that tax rate will have to ultimately rise to 44%, the payroll tax. Then there's the income tax on top, which the president wants to take to 40%. Then there's state tax in most states, and uh, sales tax, and so you end up having to take 100% of people's income. And yet the president, three and a half years in, won't talk about reforming Social Security or Medicare. And when the Republicans do, it's the, oh, you're throwing granny off the cliff. It's like, you're killing the kids. The, the biggest surprise that I have is that young people will vote for a Democrat. They look at this and say, holy cow. The only guys that are worried about the future of our country and our future are Republicans. But the, the Democrats, you know, they, they talk about social issues, draw in the young people, and, and they vote on that issue. It's like, uh, I mean, there won't be any houses like this if, uh, if, uh, if, if we stay on the road we're on. So please? Yeah. I heard a, heard a voice. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, please. Uh, Dr. Lonnie, we are former Bostonians. Oh. Yeah. And we, we'll talk about how we know you. Um, uh oh.
the real big issues, and where the issues are around, and how would your point of view differ from President Obama's? Yeah, thank you. And, and I can, by the way, start eating. Those of, you who have, those of you who have food in front of you, it's warm and start eating. Um, and this is meant to, I'm standing up so I can see you, but I'm not standing up so that you have to stop and look at me. So, uh, and it's important to look at your food as you're eating it. All right. <laughs> Don't see you putting a fork in your finger here. Uh, uh, <laughs>
uh, by our friends and and and, uh, and unfortunately by our foes. Well, and and it's, it's no it's no wonder that people like Kim Jong Un, uh, the new leader of North Korea, announces a long range missile test only a week after he said he wouldn't. Uh, because it's like, what's this president going to do about it? Uh, you know, if you can't you know, if you can't act, why don't don't threaten? Them. Please. Just to follow on the Iraq. Palestinian nation? Well, the Palestinians would say, oh, no way. 
Uh, we're an independent country. You can't, you can't, you know, guard our border with other Arab nations. Uh, and then how about the airport? How about flying into this Palestinian nation? Um, are we going to allow uh, military aircraft to come in and, and weaponry to come in? And if not, who's going to keep it from coming in? Well, the Israelis. Well, uh, the Palestinians are going to say we're not an independent nation if Israel is able to come in and tell us what can land at our airport. These are problems that are very hard to solve. All right? and, and I look at the Palestinians not wanting to see peace anyway for political purposes, uh, committed to the destruction and elimination of Israel and these thorny issues, thorny issues, and I say, there's just no way. And so what you do is you say you, you move things along the best way you can. You hope for some degree of stability, but you recognize this is going to remain an unsolved um, problem. I mean, we, we live with that in, in China and Taiwan. All right, we have, we have a, a, a potentially uh, volatile situation, but we sort of live with it. And we kick the ball down the field and hope that ultimately somehow something will happen and resolve it. We don't, we don't go to war to, to try and uh, resolve it imminently. Uh, on the other hand, I got a call from a former Secretary of State. I won't mention which one it was. Um, uh, but this individual said to me, uh, uh, you know, I think there's a prospect for, for uh, a settlement between the Palestinians and the Israelis uh, after the Palestinian elections. I said, really? And... Uh, you know, his answer was, was yes. Uh, I think there's some prospect. And I, and I didn't uh, delve into it, but you know, I always keep open. I mean, I don't always keep open the idea, but I, I have to tell you, the idea of pushing on the Israelis to give something up, to give the Palestinians, to get the Palestinians to act, is the worst idea in the world. We have done that time and time and time again. It does not work. So, so the, the, the only answer is show strength. Again, American strength, American resolve. And if the Palestinians someday reach a point where they want peace more than we're trying to put, force peace on them, then it's worth having the discussions. But till then, it's just uh, it's just wishful thinking. You, know, you guys yeah. sit down. So I, I mean, don't you notice the afterwards? Please, don't you want to take like 12 miles from that slot. Now it's my mouth. Individuals in this room obviously are your supporters. I am very concerned about. The average American who doesn't know you, uh, there is a, a terrible misconception, and I spent numerous hours trying to, I hate being a defender when you are such a deserving individual. Years and years ago, uh, I called George Bush Sr., and he had helped me in my campaign in Massachusetts when I ran for Senate. I told him that there is a guy named Clinton who's going to him for the following reasons, and he laughed. Right now, I'm very concerned. Women do not want to vote for you. Uh, Hispanics, majority of them do not want to vote for you. College students don't. Uh, after talking to them and explaining and rationalizing on a one-on-one -on -one basis, we are able to change their opinions, but on a mass level, how, how, what do you want us to do, this group here, as your emissaries, going out to convert these individuals to someone who's obviously going to be such an incredible asset to, to this country? We want you. But well, what do we do? Just I have, tell us I have how some, we can help. I have some good news for you. It's not impossible. And the reason I say that is, for instance, the New York Times had a poll last week, New York Times and NBC, and I was leading by two points among women. All right, now the president came out and said this is an outrageous poll, they don't know what they're doing, but by the way, the polls at this stage make no difference at all. But the point is, women are, are open to supporting me, they like the president perfectly, but they're disappointed. They're disappointed with the job they're seeing with their kids, they're disappointed with their own economic standing right now. So we we can we can capture uh, women's votes. We're having a much harder time with Hispanic voters. And and if the Hispanic voting bloc uh, be, becomes as committed to the Democrats as the African American voting bloc has in, in the past, why we're we're in trouble as a party and I think as a nation. Rubio. Exactly. And uh, hey, come on. Yeah. And so on. <laughs> Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. We have some great 
We have some great Hispanic leaders in our party that will help communicate what our party stands for. And uh, uh, what, what I, I mean, frankly, what I need you to do is to raise millions of dollars because the president is going to have about 800 or 900 million dollars. That, I mean, that's, that's by far the most important thing you can do. Because, well, because you don't, uh, you, you, don't, uh, you don't have the capacity to speak to hundreds of thousands of people. I will be in those debates. There will be, I don't know, 150 million Americans watching. If I do well, it'll help. If I don't, it won't help. You will uh, do we'll, so well. Well, the we'll, uh, debates are incredible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, but, uh, but advertising makes a difference. And the president will engage in a personal uh, character assassination campaign. And, uh, and so we'll have to fire back, one, in defense, and number two, in offense. And, uh, and that's, that'll take money. By the way, the deal see the ads here. Florida will be one of those states that, um, that, is, uh, that is the key state. Uh, and, uh, and so all, all the money will get spent in 10 states. And this is one of them. So I, the best thing I could ask you to do, I mean, yeah, sure, talk to people and tell them what, well, you know me, and word of mouth makes a big difference. Um, but, you know, I, I'm not terribly well known. Uh, by the general American public, because well, we go through. rich boy. Yeah. I mean, they say he's a rich they man. Don't, but so don't worry. Given all, given all those negative things, given all those negative things, the fact that I'm either tied or close to the president, and the fact that you know that he's out there talking about the one-year anniversary of Osama bin Laden being captured, unemployment coming down, unleashing his campaign, new camp, and we're still sort of tied. That's very interesting, and and as as encouraging, please. I would disagree with that. I think a lot of young children coming out of college feel they were let down by the president. They feel that there's not a job out there for them. And they thought they were making 60000 now they're making 30000 know, Very similar to the U6. Yeah, yeah. My question to you really is, why don't you stick up for yourself? To me, you should be so proud of your wealth. That's what we all aspire to be, kill ourselves. We don't work in our time. We're away from our families five days. I'm away from my four girls five days away from my wife. Why not stick up for yourself and say, why is it bad to be a, 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 to aspire to be wealthy and successful? You know, why is it bad to uh, to uh, kill yourself? And why is it bad to cut 30 jobs to protect 300? And when you, people talk about you cutting jobs, you saved companies that were stripped, that were failing in terms of these two jobs. So my question is, when is that? Picked up. There's so many things that don't get picked up in a campaign. 
uh, because people aren't watching yet. By the way, most people don't watch through the summer. I said we're going to go into a season here starting from the mid June, or almost with no attention paid. Then after Labor Day, in September, October, that's when we get the clock. For the last three years, all everybody's been told is, "Don't worry, we'll take care of it." How are you going to do it in two months before the elections to convince everybody you got to take care of yourself? Um, well, there are 47 percent of the people who will vote for the president no matter what. All right, there are 47 percent who are with him, who are dependent upon government, who believe that, that they are victims, who believe that government has a responsibility to care for them, who believe that they are entitled to health care, to food, to housing, to you name it. But that's it's an entitlement, and the government should give it to them. And they will vote for this president no matter what. And, and, I mean, the president starts off with 48, 49, 48. He starts off with a huge number. Uh, these are people who pay no income tax. 47% of Americans pay no income tax. So our message of low taxes doesn't connect. And he'll be out there talking about tax cuts for the rich. I mean, that's what they sell every, every four years. And, uh, and so my job is not to worry about those people. I'll never convince them that they should take personal responsibility and care for their lives. What I have to do is convince the 5 to 10% in the center that are independent, that are thoughtful, that look at voting one way or the other, depending upon, in some cases, emotion, whether they like the guy or not, what, they, what it looks like. I mean, it's the, the, when you ask those people, I mean, we do all these polls. I find it amazing. We poll all these people to see where you stand in polls. But 45% of the people will vote for the Republican, and 48 or 49.